After going through some political negotiations, the Republic of China's 1947 11-line map was changed into the 9-line by the time communist troops seized control of mainland China. Ever then, the map has been a source of conflict. Although the U.S. Navy routinely patrols the region and claims it wants to preserve the freedom of navigation, Beijing claims the demarcation line as its own, covering nearly the entirety of the South China Sea and overlapping with the territorial claims of the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, and Vietnam. This is not just a local dispute, though. China doesn't believe a word of it and has been erecting military facilities nearby for years. That was the standoff for a while, but after Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, visited Taiwan in August 2022, relations took a noticeable turn for the better. China then increased its aggression, escalating its fighter jet maneuvers, spotting warships near U.S. bases, and more recently, flying Chinese surveillance balloons into U.S. airspace. Diplomacy is now on life support, and legislators from all sides are so concerned that in a leaked memo, General Mike Minihan warns that open conflict between the United States and China could occur as early as 2025. What's happening then, as it appears like China and the United States are heading straight for war? Defense spending is more than just numbers. It shows political commitment. Occasionally, a state must bare its teeth and remind everyone that it is dangerous because that is the alternative to having a weak military force, whether through parades, drills, or arms deals. The United States defense budget for 2023 is estimated to be $816 billion, far larger than China's $230 billion. This significant disparity in spending is due to the fact that China's official defense spending does not account for its paramilitary forces, Coast Guard research and development programs, space program, or any other related activities. After accounting for labor expenses and buying power fluctuations as of 2017, China's defense spending, which is estimated for 2023, is equivalent to 87% of the Pentagon budget. The difference between America and China doesn't appear to be as great as previously thought. Even if America is spending its defense budget all over the world, it has probably even increased recently. The underlying unstated considerations that have many U.S. military leaders alarmed are that China concentrates its resources primarily in its immediate area in order to get more value for its money. As for what China hopes to accomplish with its enhanced military might, that's not really a secret. By 2030, China hopes to take control of the region known as the First Island Chain. Taiwan is located in the middle of this chain, which also includes Japan, the Philippines, Indonesia, and other countries. China wants to subjugate Taiwan, even if it means using force to do it. China has been receiving high-tech jets, aircraft carriers, advanced submarines, and other military equipment. U.S. authorities are concerned about this sudden military buildup because they believe a war may break out sooner than it has in a long time. Beijing is working toward its goals with a number of deadlines in mind, one of which being 2024, an election year in Taiwan and the United States. There is a perception that the upcoming American election will be divisive and unsettling. Furthermore, according to Taiwanese officials, the Chinese military will have amassed sufficient air power and firepower by the end of 2024 to launch an invasion. Hence, 2025 is the perfect year for Beijing to launch an offensive. So the reasoning goes. However, there are still many unanswered questions. One thing is certain. If the U.S. and China engaged in combat within the next 10 years, they would not directly target one another's mainlands. Taiwan would probably take center stage since China is too large and the U.S. is too far away for that. Both the East and South China Sea's Beijing's biggest weakness is the network of islands and archipelagos that encircle the city and keep its mainland isolated from the oceans. The narrow passageways that connect the South China Sea to the Indian and Pacific Oceans are formed by the islands of Sumatra, Jaffa, Borneo, Luzon, and Mindano with sporadic islands scattered across the region between. The same is true in the East China Sea, where the islands extending from Japan to Ryukyu to Taiwan stand like centuries-old lookouts into the sea the moment Chinese warships leave their ports.
Any of these areas can harbor and conceal air and missile assets, whether friendly or enemy. They would be well within the reach of air and missile systems and visible to Taiwanese and Japanese monitoring. You can see the stakes by glancing at the map. China is a major trade power, accounting for the largest portion of world goods exports. However, access to the world's oceans is not assured. Beijing's business as usual is unsustainable since the first island chain holds China's power projection, which leaves its enormous economic empire at the whim of the world's most powerful naval force. Us carrier combat groups can rather easily shut the choke points between the islands and the archipelagos. If there are any naval blockades, they could affect Malacca, Sunda, Lombok, Karamata, Makassar, Mindoro, and Luzon, particularly in the Malacca Strait. If over the next 10 years Washington and Beijing were to suffer a setback, both would want to control the islands and archipelagos that comprise the first island chain in the South China Sea, stifling China's economy and weakening the Communist Party's hold on power. The People's Liberation Army Navy had no chance of defeating the U.S. Navy, not in the next 10 years at least, therefore instead of engaging the American fleet head-on. The PLA's mission would be to block the choke points and keep them closed. The Navy would try to take control of a few of the nearby islands and stay there long enough to install air defense and anti-ship missile systems. China has made significant investments in its official islands in the South China Sea because, with the new weapons in place, its forces could drive American fleets out of the choke points they have identified and secure guaranteed access to the world's oceans. Since the PLA Navy cannot directly open the choke points in the South China Sea, it can instead use the air and missile systems found on the artificial islands to augment its firepower. As of this writing, Beijing has fully militarized three of its seven artificial islands, Mischief Reef, Subi Reef, and Fiery Cross. These islands serve as unsinkable aircraft carriers, each armed with anti-ship and anti-aircraft missile systems, laser and jamming equipment, as well as fighter jets. While the tactical situation in the East China Sea is slightly different but still urgent, it's important to remember that this is about more than just battleships and negotiations. It's also about what the public is told to believe by governments and what they see and hear in the media. The media frequently features back and forth, and it also emphasizes patriotism and national pride in China and the nations bordering the South China Sea. Similar to Vietnam and the Philippines, China uses its state-run media to remind people of its historical claims and the significance of the region, using nationalistic rhetoric to inspire their people through historical and patriotic tales can escalate tensions and lead to further disputes. In the event of a war, China's top priority would be to secure the Taiwan Strait, allowing these naval groups to coordinate effectively. Gaining control of Taiwan or even weakening its defenses would resolve this challenge and provide China with a strategic passage through the first island chain, granting access to the open oceans. The Raishu Islands and Taiwan divide China's navy, splitting it into two groups, one in the north and east and the other in the south. China uses Taiwan for purposes other than just using it as a chess piece for its navy. It acts as a key that, by taking control of or undermining Taiwan, opens up various avenues for China to achieve its strategic goals. China gains access to essential resources including trade technology and political contacts with foreign nations, in addition to improving the operational capabilities of its navy. In the event of a confrontation between China and the U.S., Taiwan represents a dual win for China, advancing both its military objectives and larger regional interests. To prevent the U.S. Navy from entering vital regions like Taiwan and other choke points in the first island chain, China would use missiles from the land, the air, and the sea. This might seem like a brilliant idea, but there's a catch. U.S. defenses could intercept China's missiles. China is therefore at a disadvantage for the next 10 years at the very least. It is improbable that China would initiate a war when it is not in a strong position. But after 2030, things may become dicey because fifth-generation fighter jets and extremely rapid missiles could alter the course of events. China possesses the J-20 Mighty Dragon, whilst the United States possesses the superior F-35 Lightning II. Japan is only one of the U.S. many regional allies.
Thailand, Australia, South Korea, on the other hand, China is concentrating on creating hypersonic weapons and rapidly growing its armed forces, adding more aircraft carriers, while Taiwan and the Philippines are on the defensive. The PLA Navy and the U.S. Navy will have nearly the same gross tonnage of ships and nearly the same number of aircraft carriers by 2050 if this continues. In other words, an American-Chinese war is unlikely to occur in the next 10 years. But the weather forecast is looking rather stormy as storm clouds are gathering in the distance. In conclusion, the factors contributing to America's prediction of a war with China by 2025 are complex and multifaceted. Geopolitical tensions, economic competition, technological rivalry, and military posturing all play significant roles in this forecast. While war is never a desirable outcome, the current state of affairs between the two superpowers suggests that the risk is real and growing. However, it's crucial to remember that this is not an inevitability. Diplomatic efforts, economic cooperation, and international dialogue can all serve to mitigate tensions and pave the way for a more peaceful resolution. As investors, it's important to stay informed about these developments and their potential impacts on global markets. Understanding the underlying dynamics can help us make more informed decisions about our investments and navigate any volatility that may arise. So stay tuned for updates on this topic and be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more investing tutorials and insights. I appreciate you watching, and until we meet again, happy investing!